presentation. I'm going to hand it off to uh, Max, Max, uh, Max Gorski, who is going to share with you guys uh, the next few slides. So take it away, Max. Thank you. Give me one moment here. Um, can you open that up while I'm hitting the uh, uh, Google Drive here? Give me one second. Sorry, I don't have it open because I'm doing two other things. You, you, want, you want me to do something? Yeah, go ahead and hit the first uh, slide while I log in here. There we go. I got it recording, by the way. So everybody, uh, we are recording. If you can mute, that would be great. Thank you. I see everybody is muted. Um, I do I need to do the intro again? Yeah, go ahead and do the intro. I'm going to open up this slide here I got. This uh, slideshow that I'm about to present is um, is now used by the Toledo Bitcoin Meetup. It was originally Detroit uh, Bitcoin Social and was created by Ryan Rong, who founded that uh, that meetup. Um, since I was a co-host, he let me repurpose it and reuse it and edit it and stuff for for use with this with this meetup. So originally by Ryan Rong, and now this version is edited by me, Super Testnet. Um, there's a disclaimer here: we do not give financial advice. But that said, buy Bitcoin. And now right here at the beginning of this slideshow, I'm almost immediately going to turn it over to Max Accorsi, who's going to lead you through the first few slides. Thank, thanks, Super. Um, so before we uh, get into you know, what Bitcoin is and why it's important, uh, we really need to understand what money is and what, why is Bitcoin now replacing money? So just on an overview, you're going to uh, uh, get a high level of the monetary policy over uh, of very brief history of where we've been, uh, why we've used certain things, and why we're now using Bitcoin. So the, the simple beginning question is, what is money? Well, it's really three things, and we've all heard these in various forms. It's a store of value, meaning we can store our human labor into this and be able to use it as a medium of exchange and trade. You know, maybe you want to uh, take your labor from uh, in, the far, or in the fields farming and go buy uh, some cattle, go buy some meat. It is also a unit of account. So meaning you can uh, essentially break this up and, and uh, uh, make it a little more divisible uh, so you can actually keep track of where you're actually uh, spending and uh, earning your uh, time labor back and storing it again as the cycle continues to repeat as a store of value. I really like this chart. I'm not going to go through them all um, in super detail, but I really like this chart on the right side, giving you a distinction between Bitcoin today, gold of where we've been the past 5,000 years, and fiat money. And if uh, uh, some people do not know, fiat money is uh, the shorter, ver or the, uh, uh, it's another term for government money, uh, essentially paper money that's printed out of thin air. So you can see the traits of money, verifiable, fungible, portable, durable, divisible, scarce, established history, censorship resistance, unforgettable costliness, um, and then at the bottom, uh, we had to add for Bitcoin, is it openly programmable and uh, how you know, distributed uh, it is. I, I think we have a really good idea of what's going on in the chart, but I want to uh, point out um, a few uh, traits um, here. We can uh, verify this. It's, it's kind of hard to verify gold. You can do it, but you need expensive machinery. You need people that know how to run it. And we need to waste a little bit of gold to make sure we can test it and all that stuff. Uh, same thing with fiat. You can call up the uh, Federal Reserve and say, how much money do you got in your uh, uh, bank account? Um, but it's, it's not going to be the same. It's, it's yeah, not the serial number legit that I see on my, on my dollar bill. It, it, yeah, it, exactly. And, and exactly what we just uh, showed on mempool.space and the uh, RPC BTC Explorer on uh, uh, your own node, uh, we can verify uh, the, the Bitcoin supply. It's, it, it is truly a marvel. You can see where all, all the coins are at at any moment, every 10 minutes. Um, uh, what else do I want to highlight here? No, yeah, yeah, go ahead, skip it. That's fine. Um, I, I want to emphasize as well the difference between easy money and hard money. 
all of this money that we are interacting with in today's world uh, is easy money. It's, 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 uh, it's weak money. It's, it's, it's uh, money that can be easily manipulated and inflated away into oblivion. Hard, hard money has a hard cap. Okay. We, for Bitcoin, we have a 21 million supply cap. This is why gold was so, um, uh, so strong uh, for 5,000 plus years. Uh, the supply was very hard to increase because uh, how difficult it was to pull out of the ground and refine it. Um, Super, you, you, you want to touch on the um, stock to flow ratio or you want me to keep going? Sure. Yeah, the stock to flow ratio is a, is a model for um, ass assessing the past and present um, price of an, of an asset based on two properties, the stock and the flow. The stock refers to the existing supply. Uh, in the case of Bitcoin, we, the, the current existing supply that's circulating is uh, 18.6 million um, out of that 21 million. And then uh, the flow is the amount of new coins that are entering the, uh, entering the, the network, uh, which is about uh, 800 a day right now. Um, with gold, it's similar. There, there's a certain amount of ounces that are that are above ground and, and are in circulation, and then the new um, new amounts of gold that are um, pulled out of the ground are about two percent of the total supply. Uh, two, so two percent of however many ounces there are above ground is how much is added to it. Uh, and by taking these numbers, you can actually get an assessment of um, you, you can you can estimate what current supply is and get and use measurements to uh, assess what current demand is. And then create a price model out of that, because uh, as we all know from Economics 101, um, once you know the supply and demand, you know the price. So this, these things help you as, assess past and current um, prices by because because you know those two things. You can get from the stock to flow model. You can get a model of the current um, of the current supply and how it's changing, and then uh, compare that to what what the demand has been in, in a certain time period, uh, and then uh, the uh, that, that's what the stock of flow model is, and a lot of a lot of people use it. Uh, it's a popular model for um, thinking about what future prices might be. Although personally, I don't subscribe to the view that you can you can predict in the future what what people will do. Uh, investors, you know, are experts in trying to do that and making money off of their off of their attempts. So uh, you know, see that you can Google that that term for more information. It's a popular model for. Uh, it's especially useful for past. Uh, for the past and the present, I think I think it's less useful for the future. But there's a lot of people who disagree with me and make a lot of money by disagreeing with me. So check and Google that for more info. Yeah, if you want to check out um, uh, Plan B, um, he is uh, 100 trillion USD, I believe, on Twitter. He's kind of the guy that um, connected Bitcoin stock or the stock to flow model over to Bitcoin and saw how superior it was uh, compared to gold and others. So again, you know, uh, don't trust verify and uh, we'll believe it when we see it, but it's, it's an interesting uh, perspective on, on how to value something. So, so, okay, so bringing it to gold, this is what we're competing against. The reason why gold stores value so well is because it has a very high stock in terms to its flow. So it has a, 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 a very high um, a, a amount of uh, stock and and what is uh, uh, available to be presented to the market, but uh, relative to what is actually in circulation, um, it does not meet that demand. So therefore, that's why the price um, uh, stays where it's at. Uh, we've historically had about a one, two, you know, maybe on high times, maybe three percent at most um, inflation, if you will, out of gold. And how that happens is miners um, they dig a hole in the ground, they find some shiny rock, and start refining it. So. Uh, that well, also, I'd like to point out its supply or its uh, flow used to be lower, but modern modern technology has made gold mining a lot more efficient. So numbers have bumped up from all the way from one percent flow to two percent flow because we're we've gotten pretty good at it. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point to 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 make there. Um, the, the the other point I want to make, and this goes for the entire space, and we can you can do this across any aspect of your life. And it's simply this, I'll just read the statement. Gold is valuable mostly because people value it. That's just like anything else in life. Um, you value um, you know, your spouse's you know, life or relationship, I hope, um, you know, so you do anything to you know, take care of them. Same thing, you would, you, you would try to find 
uh, something to, that has your most, uh, you know, the most highest properties to store your time uh, value that you earned. And gold just happened to be it. We, it, ha it has some special properties to it that we found out over many millennia, but um, it's really what humans subjectively value things at. Um, and finally, gold has no counterparty risk. Uh, and stored except when it's stored at somebody else's bank so what really quickly what's a counterparty a counterparty is um you know essentially somebody on the other side of uh, whatever trade you're you're making so if you're going into a coffee store you're buying a coffee your counterparty would be the starbucks or the coffee of artista giving your drink um, and gold doesn't have any risk when you hold it because like Bitcoin, it's a perpetual asset. It's nobody's liability. The only way it becomes a liability is when you hold maybe a, an IOU against that and that gold is stored in a vault overseas somewhere. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, you can have some risks um, uh, with there, but that's, that's basically the, the summary of gold and why we uh, you know, reach, reach the point of where we have we have. So why do we even have, you know, fiat currency and fiat money? Um, for this example, the Romans back in their day, they uh, started to, uh, it was called coin clipping, actually. They started to remove a little bit of the gold and silver out of their coins that were in circulation. A little bit at a time, 1% here, another 1% there. Eventually, the supplies were, were cut, um, you know, so substantially that the coins were worthless. Same thing for China and India, and thus obviously the empire collapsed after uh, you know, its 400 plus year run. Same thing for China and India, when they were actually on the silver standard. They had a supply increase, I didn't realize it was that high at 15% a year. Um, and thus, you know, when you got conquerors coming uh, you know, and traveling uh, east, and they see the silver standard, well, gold's just gonna completely blow silver out of the water. So you can see why Europe took the lead uh, from China and India. So we can clearly see that you know, gold is the uh, king standard, and if you don't have hard money, you will be conquered. I'd just like to point out here, I, um, another, another example of this is uh, in, in Venice, uh, which is a, a state in Italy. From 1200 to 1500s, Venice had a uh, a hard money standard of, of they, they didn't debase their currency, uh, which was a, a gold backed uh, coin is what they used for, for currency, or not a gold backed coin, a, a coin made of gold that they used for 300 years, from 1200 to 1500. And then during that time, Italy was the biggest power in the world um, because, because they had hard money. But eventually, you know, in times of crisis, it's always very convenient to debase your currency and create more of it for yourself by making it easier to create, like not putting as much gold in there, but, but then forcing everyone to accept it at the same value. And then that's, that's where you get revolutions and reformations and stuff. And it's, it, 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 always, it usually ends pretty badly um, when you debase a currency. So seeing that happen in our society doesn't, doesn't bode well. So your next transition from all this, um, uh, you're, we found out there are failures with gold. Gold is heavy. Uh, it is divisible, but we have new technologies now to make things even more divisible. Uh, they're lighter in weight, again, to carry around and so on and so forth. So we started to create IOUs and we call that paper currency or fiat money. And it's essentially, it's a promissory note, uh, again, uh, for somebody uh, to receive gold uh, at the end uh, after they um, have, you know, uh, did their job or, or uh, uh, borrowed the money with interest or something like that, uh, that, that they use. So instead of carrying around all that gold, it's just easier and safer to carry a, a paper note than a bar of gold. Um, I, I like these stats too, the dollar, um, you used to have a certificate to receive one ounce of silver gold from the bank, and uh, they had a peg at $20 for the one ounce uh, for gold. And of course, that peg was elevated from $20 to $35, I believe, in 1931. I'm not sure. 1933, they confiscated all the gold from uh, the banks 
uh, from uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's Executive Order 6102. And eventually, we completely left the peg from Nixon uh, in 1971. Uh, and you could kind of term what we're on, or you could call if, you know, for a term of uh, what some people uh, look at the U.S. dollar as um, something called the petrodollar. And in short, I'm sure people have heard that it's essentially um, kind of tying together the operations of how the United States works through, obviously, internally, but where we as America try to conquer other lands. And you always notice that it's in oil rich, you know, areas, you know, why do you want that extra oil? Well, oil brings potential energy and we can apply that energy in you know new ways so we've left the, exactly exactly so we left that gold we left the hard money standard you know almost 100 plus years ago at this point and completely left it you know practically 50 so we're we're going to hit a breaking point um you know here you know sometime with this fiat currency we got one more slide and then we will get into um you know very briefly uh, so yeah, I just want to mention one more thing about the petrodollar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the yeah. way that the petrodollar uh, works, or just the regular dollar, which is some people, its critics call it the petrodollar sometimes, is through contracts with Saudi Arabia and Iran and other countries trust to say if you, if you guys sell any of your oil to other countries, you have to denominate that in dollars. You have to they you have to uh, tell them give me a certain amount of U.S. dollars in order to buy this stuff. Or and if you don't do that, we'll bond you. Right. Um, but yeah. We don't trust these countries. And the, the, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. The reason why we do that is because it's end for U.S. dollars. And since we control the supply of the dollar through our federal banking system, and uh, we can we can create contracts with oil selling countries to stimulate demand for dollars, that results in us having a great amount of control over the values of, of over the value of the dollar. We have we have we control supply and we can influence demand. Um, but unfortunately, that system is starting to break apart. Well, I got, fortunately or unfortunately, it's starting to break apart as oil is found by other countries who don't who don't need to go to Saudi Arabia and Iran and these other places, uh, and countries that we can't bomb very easily, like China and Russia, uh, are finding their own oil reserves. And then also some of these countries who we didn't trust or don't trust, or they don't they don't trust us either. And they're like, you know what? We're not going to value this old contract that we made with you in 1970s. We're going to start selling our our oil for other other things and that reduces our ability to influence demand on the dollar and we'll see what happens with that currently it's not much of an effect because uh demand for dollars is at an all-time high due to coronavirus um but we'll see where that ha where that leads and and just to add um the reason why pricing oil in dollars is so important is because oil is the base denominator in so many raw material, so many other items such as tires, plastics, toothpaste, it oils and absolutely mm -hmm. everything. So there's a cascading effect of other raw materials then being priced in dollars, giving it more power. Thank you, Julio. Yeah, that, yeah, that's a great that's a great point actually. That was DC, guys. Or yeah, 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 yeah. That was that, yeah, that was DC. Where are you at, DC? No, are, are you in uh, America? Or are you in um, uh, Europe? Where, where are you at? Remember, we're recording right now, so don't dox yourself if you don't want to be. Uh, yeah, on no, yeah, never mind. We're recording. Don't dox yourself. Ignore my question. We'll talk about that afterwards. Um, so the last slide here, and this is the end of the road. Um, we're at fiat currency, which is having pure, one hundred percent, full faith in your government. And Super is going to click a link here to show you how much of this free infinite money that we are printing. What is our number at the US debt clock? Um, yeah, $27 trillion uh, we are currently in debt. Um, now again, realistically that number means nothing because we're just all based on a debt society, but eventually somebody's gotta pay that bill. You know, somebody's gotta, somebody's gotta yeah. do something. This, I disagree with you. I, I disagree with you, Max. I don't think there's ever any intention of our yeah, I, ever repaying that debt. Yeah, I, or, or, yeah they'll, I, or they'll repay it with fake, uh, with with monopoly money. Yeah, you know. in super inflated dollars. But I don't, I don't think I, I don't remember the exact details. But I remember reading somewhere that in order to repay that would take 
so many years of even in, even taking a hundred percent of everybody's income, it would take forever to pay that debt off because it's increasing so quickly. I mean, I just saw something the other day. They're going to give another trillion dollars a day or trillion dollars a week to to the bank. So we spend it like it's monopoly money, and we have absolutely no intention of paying it back. I, I honestly agree. But let's uh, let's not get into the weeds on. Um on how much that is the the point of this is that the it's, it's like the first line of the satoshi white paper is that we we trust our governments to to manage our money supply well and the the point of the debt clock is that they're not managing it well you know if if, if you have if you have a certain amount of income and you're in that much debt uh, you're not managing your your money well so so we want to we want an alternative and this is where we're going to get into how bitcoin solves this problem well well said so, so I find it funny um, when you search on Google, like the average lifespan is 27 years. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty much guaranteed to fail. Just pick a date uh, when they're actually going to fail. Um, and, and really this happens exactly what Rick was saying. Yeah, look at that, Google, 27 years. Uh, uh, and it breaks it down in a nice chart uh, from 1450. Uh, you know, again, best as you can to scrape that data together. But um, yeah, you know, 80 years, 50 years, 100 years, it, it doesn't last that long. Um, the, we get a really massive distortion too in income equality through the Cantillon effect. And essentially what the Cantillon effect is, the closer you are to the guy with the money printer, the more money you are going to get. For example, if you live on a river, more likely than not, you're going to drink a lot more water than if somebody living in a desert with little to no water. So, Or you're going to have to pay a lot less for it. Exactly. Or you're actually just going to have to pay a lot less for it. It's just more readily available for you. So it's the same thing with the Cantillon effect. Some people um, got uh, their uh, $1,200 checks immediately the day that uh, it, it sent out. Um, some people got it six months later or even a year later. Some never got it. Um, but the point is, how close were you to the money printer and did you have all of your ducks in a row? Uh, and if you happen to be a bank, you, got, you didn't get a $1,200 check, you got, you know, billions. Well, you got billions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, even better. If, you, you know, if you're actually part of the fractual reserve banking system, you're, you're direct line plugged in, baby. You're ready to go. You know, you, you got to start that money printer. It's automatic. And favorite industry, you know. Uh, gets these gets these huge bailouts and these things happen from the money printer uh, and then this time they've been nice enough to grant us peanuts you know and they're like well we'll also send you guys a twelve hundred dollar check but people who are really close and have lobbyists over there they get a lot more because and that's the Cantillon effect they're they're close to their friends with the guy who has his finger on the print button so that's bad yeah you can see the you can see the moral moral issues and you know the misguided compasses that these people have we have not had this level of income inequality since um rockefeller days and andrew carnegie and that was back when we were actually really churning out on america's industrial revolution and and all of this single individual money printer um just adds for a lot of uh centralization and of which, of course, makes uh, censorship extremely easy. So, um, this as we've is, seen this with Stripe and PayPal refusing to refusing to process Trump's transactions, that's an example of what of cens uh, centralization in those companies controlling his uh, controlling his payment gateways leads to censorship of the man. You know. Yes. An example. And uh, just to add, I mean, on that point of PayPal censorship, I mean, WikiLeaks several years ago about four mm -hmm. or five years ago, they were deplatformed by Visa, by PayPal, because they were releasing documents that were against the powers that be. And um, so this whole deplatforming, it has been happening for years and now it's really ramping up in terms of where the platforming the president financially as well as socially via platform. So if you think of Bitcoin as a, as a thing that is intended to solve problems, the last eight slides have been about the problem that we're trying to solve, right? Uh, and now what we're going to get into is, the, is how Bitcoin solves these things. 
So we're going to move on to that now. And thank, thank you, Max, for sharing with us monetary some, some details about monetary history and the meaning of money. Yeah, thank um, you. Where, thank you, man. So what's the solution? What do we use to solve all of these problems that we've just identified? Um, first thing, uh, when, when Satoshi launched Bitcoin in 2009, he set the standard for how we're going to solve these problems by making it open source software, right? This is something that, and what that means is uh, it's, it's not like Visa where in order to, in order to accept Visa at a company, you have to, you have to apply, first of all, you have to like sign, sign some forms and send it in and wait for a reply from Visa. And then maybe they'll send you one of their little machines or hook you up to some website where you can type in a credit card number and, and they'll process a payment for you. Um, the, the ability that Visa has and other companies like them, PayPal and such, to, to uh, allow you to receive payments in, in the modern economy is, is a very valuable service and they're not going to give that up for free. You know? So what Satoshi did to solve that, that problem that leads to, leads to things like censorship and centralization and uh, a few small people having control over the money, he, he released it as open source software. You don't have to apply for any license to set to start accepting Bitcoin at your company. You don't have to go to anyone or, or ask uh, ask for anyone's permission. You download some software on the internet. You, you know, any everyone can download a wallet in ten ten minutes or less, and then get set up accepting Bitcoin. So that's that's an example of what open source software is: is free software that anyone can use without needing to get permission. Anyone can read it. Anyone can check what the code does. I guess you have to be kind of a nerd to do that, but, uh, but that's, that's great. That's really powerful because it completely flips the game, it makes it so that the economy is based around the, the average person without needing to, um, without needing to get special permissions to do basic things like accept money. Um, another solution that he came up with is the 21 million Bitcoin max supply. And we're going to get into how we enforce or how the code enforces this, but, um, but that, that's an important thing because even with gold, we've never had a money that has a fixed supply. The supply, the increase of gold per year used to be 1%, now it's 2%. Um, with Bitcoin, it's, it's, uh, it's already less than that. And um, as far as new, new issuance coming into circulation, and down here you can see 90% 90, 90 of all Bitcoins will be mined this year. You know, only 6.25 come out. Every for every, with every block, which is better. I mean, ten percent of all bitcoins will be mined over the next one hundred twenty years. It's the um, low flow currency, which which is something we've never had before. Uh, well, we've never had something as low as Bitcoin is in terms in terms of low flow. And what that the benefit of that is, it gives us a stable pricing mechanism to uh, assess assess what things should cost. And that's something that's that's going to be new and and. Uh, that is new and is going uh, has already been changing the way people who operate in this economy evaluate what they're going to sell their goods and services for. Um, so that that's really important. A couple other properties of Bitcoin: uh, it is div uh, Bitcoins are divisible, very divisible into many different species. Uh, people get confused about what satoshis or sats are. You see them on some exchanges like Chuck, where it'll ask you how many sats you want to buy. Those are fractions of them. Uh, 100, 000, 100 million of them uh, total up to being one full Bitcoin. Uh, they're, they're the pennies of the network, the smallest, the smallest unit, just like a penny is the smallest unit of a dollar, a Satoshi is the smallest unit of a Bitcoin. Bitcoin also has 10 minute block times. We'll get into the drawbacks and advantages of that uh, later in the talk. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's uh, some, of the, some of the unique properties of Bitcoin that we created that would solve, that he thinks, and a lot of people who buy into this ecosystem think will we'll solve these problems. Let's, let's unpack those a little bit. Another property of Bitcoin is pseudonymous uh, addresses. So let's talk about that word pseudonymous. You might not have seen that word since literature class where you learned about you know, Mark Twain writing under a pseudonym to uh, avoid um, getting lambasted in his personal life for the opinions he wrote about, the controversial opinions he wrote about in his books. Um, the, the pseudonymity is an attempt to escape censorship, and and, um, uh, and that's that's what it's for. Instead of using your real name, you use something fake and something made up. In Bitcoin, we use these random numbers. And when you send somebody a Bitcoin transaction, you don't use their name, you don't use their physical address. You use this thing. You know, they, they come up with a random number, and you assign assign the money that you're going to send them to that, and that makes Bitcoin censorship resistant. 
it's really hard to um, uh, if, if if you if you use Bitcoin properly, you don't reveal who you are as the owner of these addresses. It's really hard to censor that and, and prohibit people from typing it or. You, you can prohibit people from typing addresses, but you can't, it's hard to enforce that, you know. Uh, so it makes Bitcoin resist censorship. We also have a transparent ledger with some exceptions involving um, private transactions. Um, but the, the ledger shows you, uh, the, the, the blockchain shows you every address that coins have been spent from and every Bitcoin address that coins have been spent to and the amounts as well. That's one of the properties of Bitcoin that um, can lead to, or that, that helps with its verifiability and account of, and uh, auditability, which are some of those properties of money from the first slide. Uh, that's why what gives Bitcoin a very high verifiability and uh, comparative, comparative, uh, high comparative to other alternatives like golden government money. It's also neutral. Bitcoin doesn't care who you are. It doesn't care if you're President Trump or President Biden. Both of them can use it. It doesn't care where you are. It doesn't care if you're in Venezuela or Iran or a sanctioned country. It'll, it, it just says, it says, is this a valid Bitcoin address? Yep. And here you go. Here's your money. You know, here's, here's whatever the guy sent to you. And another important property is that no one has control. No one knows who Toshi Nakamoto was. We know that was a fake, or we pretty sure it was a fake name. Um, and there is no CEO to summon to court if you, uh, if you if the government doesn't like how Bitcoin works or wants to change it. There's no office to send subpoenas to. There's no marketing budget. Well, that one's kind of unfortunate. If we had a marketing budget, we'd probably have Super Bowl ads. We don't, so we, we don't. Um, and then one more slide before we get to the, before we're done with the first half of this presentation. A little bit more about a wall, um, Bitcoin addresses. Um, a wallet is a collection of Bitcoin addresses. Those are these random number thingies. And the stuff about public keys and private keys is, is the cryptocurrency. Um, it's based on cryptography, this, the science of uh, concealing information. And in this case, the information you want to conceal is um, the data you want to conceal is the, the, uh, the, the data that lets you uh, spend your coins. You, you want to keep that data secret so that no one else can get it and then spend your coins for you. So we use this public-private key cryptography that was invented in the 1970s um, and has really changed the world in, in terms of security. Um, you, generate, you generate these private numbers uh, and then you generate a public number that is, uh, that is based on this thing. And if, as long as you keep this number secret, this is, this is the number that you, your wallet will generate for you that allows you to spend coins if you receive any. And this public number uh, is what goes on the blockchain. This is what allows people to send you coins. If people send it to here and then you use this to spend the coins. As long as you keep this one secret, no one can ever take your money from you. This is what makes Bitcoin very verifiable. This is what makes it um, under your personal control. So that's a uh, private public key cryptography. It's very important to this space. Um, public, public and private key, key, key Photography is also what protects your bank account. If you've ever used internet banking, it's what protecting your connection to Zoom right now. Uh, it protects the nuclear footballs. At least whoever made uh, Ryan Ron when he made this thing, he, he said he says that I don't know if they still use that technology to secure the nuclear footballs. They might use something else. Down here, he has some information. This is very high high level. This number here, the secret or private key. Uh, is a number between one and this very large number, which is two to the 160th power. Uh, and as long as you can generate such a, a random number one in this, case, you can then be sure that no one else is going to guess your number because you know people have a hard time guessing what number I picked if I pick a random number between one and 100, let alone if I pick one of these big monsters. And then that fact that no one can guess your number allows you to control digital information. But no one else can. No one else can do it. Um, how cryptography works in more detail is not for a talk called Intro to Bitcoin. So maybe we'll do that some other time. So, but um, yeah, it's, it's very secure and cool stuff that involves really big numbers. I want to make one <laughs> point uh, before before you go back to that real quick. Uh, one point for everybody: most people in today's uh, uh, Bitcoin wallets and backups and stuff, you actually don't see that 51 character string of numbers of the private key. It's actually back in your um, um, 
uh, 12 or 24 words. Those words that you write down, okay, you, you make a Bitcoin wallet that says write down 24 words. That's those words is accessing that private key. So you don't have to remember, you know, L4 T A C like a Bitcoin address. You can just scan a QR code or in this case for the private, you know, public or public address, you scan your QR code instead of typing the address, your private key, you go ahead and memorize, write down, put on a metal backup, something, those 12 or 24 words. I just wanted to uh, emphasize that. Yeah, some of the some of the technology we use for uh, easing the easing the user interface of these things has improved a lot since the beginning. In the beginning, you would deal with in the beginning of Bitcoin, you would deal with these long random strings of numbers for your private keys, and even to this day, you still deal still deal with this stuff when you're copy pasting somebody's address. Yeah. But anyway, as he was pointing out, a lot of this, this part has mostly been abstracted away, so you don't have to deal with with your private keys directly, you deal with 12 words, which uh, have your private keys in them. Any questions at this point? We're halfway through. All right. Uh, keep on you've going. Had chance, you've had your chance, we're gonna keep going. Part two is about the Bitcoin network. So let's get into this. First thing I wanna tell you about the Bitcoin network uh, is that it's decentralized as represented by this graph here, each of these uh, represents a computer that's running the software that powers the Bitcoin network. And there's a lot more than, you know, 10 as, as this thing, or eight as this thing is showing us. But um, do, let, let me contrast this with an, with an alternative system like Visa. Uh, if in the Visa network, you'd have uh, essentially one large computer in Visa's headquarters that's processing all the transactions. They may have some that are distributed uh, in various countries that are processing just the transactions there, but they ultimately all go back to one in the center of Visa. And then everyone else uses your smartphone or your uh, merchant terminal to connect to one of Visa's big computers. And then they're running all the transactions, they're processing everything. And that makes them a centralized point of failure. If you, if you wanna take down our economy, go after Visa because they're processing, you know, 40% of all of our transactions. Whereas Bitcoin's different and in Bitcoin, anyone can run the software, anyone can verify the transactions, anyone can power this whole network uh, on their own device. And that makes it much more censorship resistant. If you want to take that down the Bitcoin network, there's no single person who's processing 40% of the transactions. You'd have to go knock down the doors of Max and me and Michael and anybody else who's running this stuff because, because we're all making this network more resilient. That's what decentralization is about. I want to show you what, uh, how Bitcoin transactions work next. And uh, Bitcoin uses an input-output account model. Um, this is uh, not all that different in my in my view, model, other than it's other than it's more um, more private. Uh, but let's just say Tom wants to send Sally some money here, and Tom's got ten bitcoins. He wants to send Sally two, so he creates a he creates a transaction, which I've represented over here as an envelope with uh, with some data in it. And on the outside of the thing, he puts his from address, right? From Tom. And it'd be you know some some random string that looks like uh, looks like this, and in the to address he put her random string. He Sally would send it to him in an email or a text message or whatever, or show him a QR code, and he would put that on the on the front of the of the uh, envelope here, or the metaphorical envelope. And then inside it, it would have an amount that he's sending to Sally's address. So in this case, is two Bitcoin he's sending to her. And he'd have the, the change that he sends back to himself. Here he's sending it back to himself, eight Bitcoins. And then there's a leftover fee, uh, which is 0 0.01 in this case. Although that, that'd be a pretty huge fee by today's standards uh, with Bitcoin at 40, 30 some thousand dollars. Um, so this, but this is just an example. You wouldn't really pay a fee that would come. So the, that's, that's how it works though. He's the input, his address is the input. Her address as well as his own address is the output. And then there's a fee that goes to the miner. And that's the input-output account model. It's also how bank accounts work, but um, they don't use random strings. So, well, they kind of. Um, anyway, so here's an example of a block. This is what a uh, what you have um, a bunch of these things. You know, a bunch of transactions from Bob to Sally, or from Tom to Sally, and from Bob to Jim, and from Abul to Nijin. Miners put them all into a, oh, that's the other thing. Who do you send this envelope to? Who do you send this transaction to? 
you send it out to the network and miners eventually get it. And miners are the ones who process transactions. Uh, and they put them into a block of data. This is, this is what a block looks like. It's got a list of transactions in it. These will all have their own little ID number, which isn't shown here. It'll have uh, who's, the, who's the recipient. Uh, it doesn't actually use their real names. They're random, you know, their block, their um, addresses would be shown kind of, kind of like this. These are like short, short representations of an address. Addresses are a bit longer than these. Um, so that, that's what it looks like on the blockchain. That was just random string paying to random string. Uh, there's an amount there, and then each one pays a fee to the miner. Now, there's a special transaction at the top of each block called a Coinbase transaction. And this confuses people because you that, you know, everyone knows that's a big company in this space. It is not um, referring to the company, though. The, uh, the Coinbase, before the company existed, the term Coinbase referred to the transaction in every block. That's the Coinbase transaction. And it's special because uh, it creates like, new Bitcoins, which go to the go to the miner who creates this block, and all all miners see all these transactions taking place. Um, you know, Tom to Sally, and Bob to you know, Mike, and Abdul to Jin, and this guy to that guy, and random address to random address. They see all these transactions happening, and they all are competing to be the first one to put them into a block, validate that they're all uh, valid addresses that have the right amounts, uh, and that everything's. Uh, hunky dory and do some cryptography on top and the one who uh, does all that work first gets this transaction he gets the 6.25 new bitcoins plus the fees that people paid to him um, but before that uh, they get they get a certain amount of bitcoins per block it's not always 6.25 it diminishes as we get closer to the 21 million uh, cap so that's what a, blo a Bitcoin block looks like. And when you hear terms like blockchain and Bitcoin blocks, there are a bunch of transactions with random numbers, paying random numbers, and uh, amounts and fees. Amounts aren't shown here. Okay. Uh, another word about the blockchain. This is the uh, buzzword that led to a lot of skyrocketing um, stock valuations in 2017. Needlessly, it's not... Uh, blockchain is not a revolutionary technology. And I, this, is, this is confusing right now, but give me three minutes to explain it and it won't be confusing anymore. Uh, each of these is a block. This is the same as this guy right here. You know. uh, and what's in a block? Well, first of all, you see this thing up here. It's the ID number for the block. And every block has its own ID number. All right? That's I can refer back and say, what block did Bob set pay Sally in? If Bob wants to prove something, he can keep the ID number of the block that his transaction got mined in, you're able to do that automatically for you and say, you can say here, this is where I paid her. This is like my receipt, you know. So that's what, there's an ID number in every block. Within the block, block there is date. Somebody's microphone just went on. Um, within the block, there is data. And you, it can be any data. Uh, Bitcoin is mostly transaction data, but I think we already showed in the beginning of this thing. You, uh, anyone can add, if you pay for it, you can add any data you want to the block. Here, this guy's just saying, hi, I'm the first block data. Um, normally, that would be a transaction, and then there'd be a bunch of other transactions after it. The, uh, another thing you'll notice in here is that is something called a previous hash. And this is what makes the blocks a chain. So each, each uh, new block that comes out references the one it comes after. So this one here says, I came after 1998, and so forth. And if you look at this, that's what this is. That's what, that's what makes it a chain. This block refers back to this one, says, I, I, this is the block I came after. So blocks of data that are chained by these ID numbers, the blockchain, and that's all it is. It's just a chain of data blocks. Uh, it's not much different from what's on the tin. Not worth evaluating someone's stock portfolio 10 billion times more than it used to be because all they did was pop out their SQL database for a blockchain. It, it's, not, it's not a very significant um, change. It's just it's a form of it's a data structure that allows you to see where uh, it allows you to track data over time. Okay, uh, every about every ten minutes, uh, it's by the chain. As time passes, uh, more transactions come out in the network. More more envelopes get sent to miners, for, uh, so to speak, and then they add them. They batch them all together and put them on the end of the blockchain. Um, so that's what this guy is representing. And I want to mention on this slide, um, 
the starting block. Uh, actually, eh, I don't have anything to mention. Oh, uh, yes, I do. Uh, it, uh, we say that's that's um, not uh, exact. Sometimes they come one minute later. Sometimes they come over an hour later. Um, it, it averages out to about 10 minutes per block. But if you ever send somebody a Bitcoin transaction and your transaction's waiting to be mined for um, you know, an hour, uh, don't be surprised that that, that can happen. Um, and we'll get into, there are some drawbacks to that that I'll, that I'll get to in a, in a minute. Uh, let's talk a little bit about mining. This is what mining looks like. And mining has a certain mystique to it that causes, like whenever I tell somebody about Bitcoin for the first time, they want to know about mining because that's, there's a lot of money to be made there, right? And it seems like, what are you doing to make, to make all this money? What are, what are the miners actually doing? Uh, well, let's first look at what mining looks like. Uh, it looks like racks and racks of computers. Uh, it looks like a data center, effectively. Um, massive tangled wires plugging into strange machines that are all hooked up at the end of this cubicle to, uh, to a, an internet connection that's sending them to the Bitcoin network. Um, what do the machines look like in more detail? They look like this. There's two fans connected to a device that's about the size of a loaf of bread. This particular unit has two of them stacked each other. And they produce um, hashes. Let me show you what a hash is. This, um, we talked about hashes down here. Um, a, a hash is a type of ID number for a, for a block or for a transaction. Uh, and different address addresses also are hashes. It's a type, it's a crypt, it's a piece of cryptographic data. You can take uh, you can take a piece of data, turn it into this random string, and then it's called a hash. Uh, it's crypt, uh, you can think of it just as a, a small amount, maybe fifty characters of uh, crypto, cryptographic data. So that's what they produce is crypto, cryptographic data, and they produce a certain amount of them per second. If this machine was very small, it wasn't very powerful, you could think of it as producing one piece of cryptographic data per second. Um, that would be very slow. These thing, if, if it was able to produce uh, a thousand hashes per second, a thousand pieces of cryptographic data, uh, that would be a kilo hash per second. If it did a million uh, instead of a thousand, it would be a mega hash per second. If it did a billion, it'd be a giga hash. These units produce uh, a lot of hashes per second in the order of terahashes. That's the next step up after billion. It's a trillion. A trillion hashes per second is a terahash. And they produce, uh, the, one of the latest models produces 110 of them. So a little bit more about what miners are doing. If you look back at our model here, miners, um, they see that Tom, had, when, when you send them this address, they, they do some basic math on these, on these transactions. Uh, they check if the address has, you know, two Bitcoins in it that he wants to send them to Sally over here. They check if the two address already has some money in it. If the two address does have some money, then they will, they, they will add point or they will add two Bitcoins to whatever's already there. So if she already has a, a Bitcoin in there. She'll now have three instead of, instead of one. And Tom, since he had 10, they'll do some subtraction on his address and they'll take, take two out of it and say, now he has, you know, 7.99 minus the, the fee that went to the miner. Um, so they do some basic math, addition and subtraction. They do some cryptography on it to produce these hashes and ID numbers and blocks and stuff. And that takes a certain amount of time. On average, we tr the network adjusts the amount of time it, uh, it takes to create these blocks, but on average, it, tr it shoots for a target of making it um, per block. And that's what, ha that's what miners do. That's what we're paying them for, we're paying them to... Um, ensure that these guys have the right amount of data uh, of money to them. They're not creating coins out of thin air, that she has the right amount that she's receiving and that they all get uh, nicely identified and hashed together and turned into blocks. So we can all verify it, that everything went properly. And that's what we pay them for. That's, that's the miner's job. Bitcoin's future is secured by uh, us. It's secured by us. Uh, all these little people in here are of different ethnicities and, they, and countries, and they all represent uh, the miners secure it because they have an incentive to do so. They get paid for it. You and I secure it. We have an incentive to use Bitcoin to pay each other um, because some of us accept it as, as currency, and uh, it's, a way to, it's a way to pay for stuff. Um, 
people who save their money in it have an incentive to do that because due to the um, supply scarcity and the growing network effect of Bitcoin, it, the, the network keeps on getting more and more valuable. So they have an incentive to use it. Um, developers have an incentive to create solutions with Bitcoin because as the network grows and becomes more valuable, more companies want to do stuff with Bitcoin and offer services to Bitcoiners. And that takes some developers to create solutions and products and apps and programs for it. So those guys have an incentive to get paid to make that stuff. And uh, yeah, it's it's secured by all of us. Everyone, it's secured by Max and I because we're running Node software that keeps the thing keeps the thing operating and verifies miners are all doing the right work. Um, everyone who uses Bitcoin and interacts with it uh, get, get, uh, benefits from it and and, uh, and helps secure it. I've mentioned network effect a couple of times in this talk, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about things. And this first sentence is really good. When a network effect is present, the value of a product or service increases according to the number of people using it. I like to use MySpace as an example here. When MySpace started, it was just Tom. Tom was the only person on it, and it didn't have much value. Uh, Tom was the guy who created uh, MySpace. I don't even know what his last name was. Um, but he was, he was the only guy on there. And who was interested in, in that network? Well, probably the only people who would be interested in it want to talk to Tom, you know, his friends. You might, might say, hey, if you want to talk to me, you can send me a message on this, uh, on this thing I created. And it's got my picture and stuff, so it's a little different from, like, an email. So they'd go on there, and, and uh, some of his friends created an account, and now they were talking to him on there. But that increased the value of the network because now it's not just Tom on there. If you want to talk to Tom or his friends, now you might want to create an account so you can talk to them because there's, there's more value there in being able to talk to all those people. And now, now those people all have an account. You can talk to all of those guys on, on MySpace. So it increases its value a bit more because being able to talk to a large number of people is valuable. That's what a network effect is. And eventually, MySpace saw huge valuations until something better came along. Bitcoin's like that, where um, in, the, in the beginning, you know, there was only a few thousand people using it, people who were on the cypherpunks email list. Um, and it wasn't very valuable because all you could do is if some of these people you could you could send them these tokens um, you could pay them with it but that's that's the that's the only value it had was being able to pay this few thousand people but you know the, let me tell you a little about who, who these cypherpunks were um, the cypherpunks were um, they came, the, it, this name is a moniker that's a take on steampunks it's like a literature in which uh, it's like a futuristic fantasy literature in which society has become very technologically advanced but the steampunks would use uh, outdated uh, steam-based technology to create like weapons and stuff and over overturn their oppressors. The cypherpunks were um, were coders who wanted to do something like that with uh, with code. They wanted to overcome the um, censorship society by using code, uh, which at the time um, cryptography was called cipher ciphers. So they called themselves cypherpunks because they created little gangs of, of internet folks who would email each other and make mailing lists or email um, forwarding things and privacy tools to overcome oppression in society. And th that's where Bitcoin was invented. Satoshi Nakamoto was on one of these cypherpunk email lists and he released it out to them and people thought it was cool and started using it to send themselves to like create currency exchanges and stuff together with it. Um, and then after once once... Uh, in two, between 2009 and 2011, more people started to join in. Anarchists and black market were the first ones after the cypherpunks to uh, adopt Bitcoin because they said, well, these guys said, this is a tool to compensate. And these guys said, well, this is just something that they can't censor. Like our black market stuff, or doesn't illegal things. Uh, we can't use normal money because PayPal and Visa won't work with us. So we'll use this thing and we'll at least be able to take money from or accept payments from anarchists and cypherpunks. But because all those people joined, the anarchists and black market people, cypherpunks, now it had a few hundred thousand people. And that raised the value of the network because now you could, if you wanted to pay any of these people, you had a tool to do so that uh, you didn't have before. So that, that increased the value. Uh, and then libertarians joined in and they said, well, we're not like anarchists. You know, we don't want no state at all, but we at least want a smaller government. So they, they started joining and saying, well, this, this tool takes money out of the hands of the government and makes it smaller, gives it a job to do. So they joined in and that increased the millions of people, which makes it a lot more valuable because of this network effect. And then speculators started and in 2013, we saw the price go all the way up to a thousand and then all the way back down to 150 or something like that. Um, 
lots of people who just wanted to speculate on the price came in. And that really raised up its value and crashed it because that's what they were doing. They were just playing with it like, or like, a, like a stock, um, like a penny stock, really. But then this year in 2021, or in the late stages of 2020, and 2020, we had institutional investors climb in who said, because of coronavirus, our government is debasing our currency and sending out bailouts and stimulus uh, to everybody, including people who aren't even in our country. Well, we're going to take uh, refuge in something that isn't going to inflate away like our dollar does. And that's, that's where institutional investors came in and have really pumped this price way up to you know, $30,500 or $35,000. And these guys aren't, aren't like the speculation of 2016. You know, they're, they're not here to buy and sell on the, on the swing trading. They're, they're here to hold their money in something that's not going to uh, devalue easily. So um, that we'll, we'll see if, uh, my, my theory is that we won't see as huge downward swings anymore um, because of these guys who are the new holders. But we'll see. No guarantees human behavior, right? Uh, currently, there are thousands of startups and traditional companies now who are building Bitcoin infrastructure. Um, you know, PayPal is making that an accepted currency at their merchants. Um, there's, it's on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and the New York Stock Exchange has some options for trading Bitcoin now. So it's, it's very huge. Uh, it's a lot bigger now. And th this network effect implies that its, its value, its fundamental value as, as a way to send money to all these different people has really, really blown up. It's, it, it's fundamentally Bitcoin's worth of a whole lot of money. Um, and, and we'll see if the price reflects that now uh, in the coming years. Another important thing about Bitcoin is decentralized tr trust. Human conflict often comes from tr disputes in trade. Um, I, I, the example I usually like to use is land wars. Most wars are fought over land where someone says, this land belongs to my ancestors. And they say, no, your ancestors sold it to us or gave it to us or whatever. They, or they just say, you've got resources on there that we want. They go and, go and fight over it. Um, that's, a, that's a trade dispute. They, they, they want you to trade that land to them, um, usually for nothing, or sometimes for something. But, they, but they dis, the other side disagrees. Your counterparty doesn't want to do it, and so they start fighting. Middlemen are appointed to resolve disputes and facilitate trust. Uh, if we all got along and never had disputes, we wouldn't need people like Visa to step in and... and uh, be, be a middleman who approves transactions. There's no scammers involved. Middlemen used to be a chief, a king, or a government. Um, I suppose they, they still are a government. But they used to be a chief or a king um, who would put his stamp on a, on a money and say, everyone can trust that this money is um, backed by a certain amount of gold or whatever precious metal they used. And that's what people, they would, tr they would put trust in that king or that chief, not in that currency, to, and to keep it, uh, keep it, strongly based and make it so that everyone could trade with each other without having to carry, around, uh, carry a club. Government took over that role, uh, but as, as we talked about, they didn't do a very job of it. They've shared some of that responsibility with institutions like the Federal Reserve, who's done an incredibly bad job of it. Uh, they're, they're a private bank who's got their own interest in accumulating a certain amount of money and less interest in helping out the poor, you know, so that they've done a terrible job. But what Bitcoin does is it makes it so that you don't need, you don't need these people to control my supply anymore. You don't need these people to resolve disputes um, between, in your transactions. You, everything's provable in Bitcoin. You can show if you paid someone out because you've got the block and you've got the transaction ID and you, everything's documented for you. It's not like the other guy can deny it. Um, We've got, we also don't need governments and chiefs and kings to control the money supply. It's controlled algorithmically by all the people who are running it, that we talked about before. So another point that is often made here is the difference between owning your money and being owed your money. If you put your money in a bank, it's, it's a credit. And what the, uh, it's a credit to your account. You can use that credit in their banking apps and in their um, Visa cards. But if you think about what that term credit means, it means it's owed to you you, you have a claim on it, but it's not in your possession. Whereas with Bitcoin, your ownership, it, it allows you to use similar apps, you know, banking apps and, and payment apps like, like they do in the Visa network or in uh, the PayPal network. But instead of having it be a credit on your account, you actually, your, your money is on your device. You know, it's actually in there. It's, it's in the computer. So it's a, the difference between owning your money versus being owed your money by somebody else really takes away a lot of this these trust issues that lead to, lead to conflicts and wars 
and um, and we'll see. It. We think that's very valuable. At least this is a article that hasn't had enough time for there to do wars over Bitcoin, but we think that some um, the fact that we don't need uh, these people who can who can really manipulate the currency, um, and we think that having everything auditable will really change these dynamics and is a really valuable thing to bring to finance. So we'll see. It's also anti-fragile. We've talked a little bit about this before. There's no office, no CEO, no one to summon to court if the, if the governments of the world don't like the way it's working. Um, there's no payroll. Um, we don't have to we don't have to worry about um, a, a bunch of servers run by PayPal and Visa because Bitcoin, and then they have to take a certain amount of fees from you in order to manage those servers. Bitcoin's work is done by volunteers, and and that keeps um, fees in theory a lot lower than um, than what you see in Visa networks and PayPal networks. I'll get into that. Of course, fees vary uh, with the exchange rate and with the amount of activity on the network, which is one of the drawbacks. But that's the next slide. Um, Bitcoin is alive as long as lots of people continue to run the software. And the software for running Bitcoin is called Bitcoin Node Software, uh, sometimes called Bitcoin Core. Um, anyone can download that software and run it. Uh, I know a lot of the people in this in this um, chat are doing that and keeping the network alive because that's it's super, it's super. Can you repeat that line one more time? Because I think that's like to me. Uh, yeah. I know another point I made, but that that is like really important. It, Bitcoin is alive as long as lots of people continue to run the software. Bitcoin nodes. That's all you need. You just need people to run the software, and software is free speech. So if you can go and unplug all that. Uh, computers running the software, then you can shut the network down. But good luck. That's tough for 10,000 plus people around the world. We want to mention that Bitcoin is not perfect. It does have drawbacks. One of the drawbacks is uh, actually you should put fees on here because they are, they are, oh, I guess this kind of goes into volatility. But anyway, first one is settlement times. Uh, it has a usually 10 minute settlement time for, for a transaction, but it can be a lot longer. It can be can be hours, it can be days, depending on what you set your fees at. Um, typically, it's settlement times are good for larger international transfers. If you're buying a house or something, you probably don't care that it's going to take an hour for it to con that it might take an hour for it to confirm. If you're sending money to your neighbor or to your uncle in Venezuela, you probably don't don't care that it takes an hour for it to confirm. It's also okay for small internet purchases. If I'm if I'm paying my Amazon invoice for something. They're, they're not going to be shipping that out for until tomorrow's business day starts anyway. So it's probably okay that it's going to take an hour for it to confirm up to an hour for it to confirm 10 minutes is basically the minimum though for, for a transaction. You can't rely, a, you can't rely on it happening any quicker than that. Um, even if you pay a large fee, so that's too long for like, if you go to, well, maybe I guess I use the example coffee shop here, but maybe that'd be fine because you can go sit down in a coffee shop. But you know, there's a lot of places where you want to get in and out. You don't want to have a transaction taking 10 minutes and standing there in line, or sitting down at a table waiting for it to happen. Um, so that's that is a drawback of Bitcoin. There is a potential solution here in the. Uh, oh, I also want to mention this is also really rapid in comparison to. Uh, in comparison to like the settlement times on other networks, so if you if you use a Visa bank card as, a, as an example here, um, when when you pay with your Visa card, the, Visa doesn't send a truck with your money out to from Chase Bank to US US Bank, for example. If, when, once you make that credit card charge, they wait for like three days or five days. They wait till Friday or they wait till Wednesday, and then then they send the trucks out to settle between banks. Um, and that's that. What that means is, when you make that charge, it's it's a credit to the account of the um, shop owner that doesn't get settled for another three days. But the benefit of having Visa there is they can, uh, to a relative degree of certainty, um, they can ensure that you're not going to have too many chargebacks and scammers uh, during that during the intermediary period. Because if you do, they'll they'll find out about it and they'll send you to collect, they'll send the scammer to collections or they'll take them to court or whatever. That's kind of in, in the terms of conditions of using them is that you don't do a lot of chargebacks. Um, Bitcoin doesn't have that option. And so, uh, well, in, in comparison to that, the settlement time is rather quick, like 10 minutes is a lot faster than waiting till Friday or waiting till Wednesday, um, international things. But uh, what's, uh, what, what's what's different about Bitcoin is you don't have anyone there to protect you from chargebacks um, in the meantime. 
like during that during that ten minutes until Bitcoin's confirmed on the blockchain, you, you, uh, someone who's savvy and using this stuff can do a chargeback and take the money back. So you really do have to wait for that ten minutes to happen and for the block to show up on the block or for the transaction to show up on the blockchain before we be sure it's Im, it's un, immutable. A potential solution here is the Lightning Network. This is developed in 2016 as a way to um, scale up Bitcoin and make it make a transaction instant. Uh, they have, uh, on, in the Lightning Network, transactions either confirm instantly or they um, fail, and then it'll say, it won't, you know, this won't work. That creates a lot better of a user experience, more like what we're used to with Visa and, and PayPal. Um, it's got its own problems, and, uh, and there's some caveats there, but this is a beginner's class, so we won't talk about it much. Another problem is Bitcoin's foot guns. This is where you shoot yourself in the foot. We all read recently about a guy who put 2,500 Bitcoins on a USB stick with a, that he password protected, and then he forgot the password. Now it's 10 years later, $35,000, and he wants to sell some, and he can't remember his password. So that's a foot gun. You know, you're, you're, in, you're responsible for your, the way you store your Bitcoins and the way you secure them, and there's nobody to call if you forget your password. It's not, it's not like PayPal here where you, know, you can send an email and say, I forgot my password, and they'll be like, okay, show us your who you say you are, and then we'll give it, let you reset it. There's no one to do that in this space. You, you're in, in sovereign control of your own money, and that you know that sucks. It, it sucks if you're the guy who puts $2,500 on your stick and then forgets the password, don't, doesn't write it down or anything. There's also the merchant acceptance issue. This is a less an issue than it was years ago. There's a lot more merchants who do accept Bitcoin now, and there's a lot of these, like, you can buy their gift cards with Bitcoins and then use it there. But it is kind of a hassle. Like I know I did a year on living only on Bitcoin. It was it was hard to. It wasn't that you got used. I got used to it. But there, there's a bit of a headache and like okay, I can use my Bitcoin, but first I got to order this debit card from this company, and then I got to send the Bitcoins to them and decide I want to put fifty dollars in this card and set, hit a button that puts the fifty dollars in the card. And now it's on there. Now I can go spend it. You know, it'd be great if I could just go into a place and the merchant was like, okay, here's the here's the thing. Scan this and hit pay. That'd be a lot easier, um, and we're getting there. It's, it's, acceptance is growing, so that's nice. I mean, PayPal's five hundred million of their users to it, and making it so that any any PayPal merchant will accept it. So that's that's going to be a big changer in this. There's the legal issues. Um, there's very few countries Bitcoin is illegal, um, but it's in a lot of countries, at least some aspects of it are regulated. Here in the states, we have regulations on the exchanges. Um, Bitcoin exchanges want to know your private information before they let you buy or sell Bitcoin on their exchange. There's requirements for like fraud protection and stuff. Uh, in other countries they have works like here we can we can use Bitcoin to do it. We can we can mine here without without needing a special license or anything. We can accept it, we can buy anything that's not illegal and we can exchange it um, legally. We that's where the legal issue is that we do have to like provide documentation and stuff in order to buy or sell it on these exchanges. But that's pretty good. That's a pretty wide open legal space. Whereas other countries are like, well, if you're going to mine, you have to have a license and you know, all this stuff. There's also volatility. Volatility in terms of price and volatility in terms of fees. Volatility has gone down, um, at least downward volatility. It's still volatile in the upward direction, but nobody cares when the price rises. We care when the price drops, right? Uh, and that's, uh, it still does occasionally drop by We've seen a 25% drop recently, pretty recently, and 10% swings, but that's going down. You know, it used to be 50% and, and 30%. But now it's now it's 25% uh, and and 10%. So that's nice to see the volatility, the downward volatility, reducing over time. Uh, so we'll see if we get there. And then there's fee volatility. Um, the amount of transactions that miners can fit into a block is limited, and they have only a certain amount of time to do it before some other miner does it first. So um, as a consequence, there's a limited amount of transactions that can go into them, which creates scarcity in terms of how, much, how many transactions can confirm at a time. And that creates a fee market where you, you have to pay a certain amount of money in, in your transaction in order to get into a block. And when there's a lot of network usage, um, there's congestion and the fees spike up. Recently, we've seen fees as high as $10 to use, a, use, a, uh, to use Bitcoin. And it's gone up as high in 2017 when there was a big frenzy about blockchains. That was stupid. Uh, fees went up to like $40 a transaction, which is insane. Unless you're doing a big international transfer of buying a house. But, you know, for you could, it made Bitcoin unusable for basic stuff. 
Lightning Network is somewhat of a solution there. It's got its own fee structure that's still small. We'll see. But those are some of the drawbacks. And, uh, we can go into, into those in, in future lessons. Last um, slide this, for everybody. This is the last slide, crypto terms. If you get into Bitcoin Twitter or Telegram or any of these social networks, you'll see some of these terms. We want you to know what they mean. FOMO is fear of missing out. Uh, if somebody buys it because of FOMO, they buy because they see everyone else is getting rich and they don't want to... They don't want to stay poor, so they buy because they're, they're scared they're missing out on, on the, all this price action. HODL, the other thing you'll see, that's uh, the word hold spelled wrong. Um, there was a guy in 2013 uh, during a big, he, he lost a lot of money trading Bitcoin. And uh, he wrote this drunken post when he was out drinking because he was uh, drinking his sorrows away because he lost you know, $100 or something. And he, was, he wrote a post. He was like, I'm not trading anymore. I'm HODLing. And he, he spelled holding holding wrong and he went into this tirade about how the, the only way that they take money that other people take money from you in this network is if you sell your coins and, and try to trade and so I'm just not gonna I'm not gonna sell or trade my coins anymore I'm just gonna hold and uh, anyway his his drunken post was quite funny to read and everybody thought it was hilarious that he put all these exclamation points and capitalized text around I am hodling and he spelled it wrong like <laughs> like his, his manifesto was spelled wrong so, so he adopted that term, and this is what we refer to as like saving your money or, or not trading it. Um, if you if you do that in this space, you're a hodler. If anybody Moon wants is, to go read the uh, long rant that he posted on Bitcoin Talk, I uh, shared it in the chat as well. It's pretty funny. It is funny. Yeah. Um, just uh, it's, uh, some drunken guy stumbling around trying to figure out why he's losing money. <laughs> um, Moon is used in two ways, a verb and as a noun. As a verb, it's used to mean a huge, a huge price increase. Like if you go up 25% in a day, we'll say, in a day, we'll say Bitcoin is moving. And we'll post uh, on Twitter and they're all getting poor relative to us. As a noun, uh, it refers to a huge price tag, a million dollars. We want Bitcoin to please go to the moon so that we can all afford to buy more stuff and just and just be jerks to everyone else. Now that's... I hope we're I hope we're not all jerks. It's yeah. Uh, <laughs> no. fun's already at the moon. My my moon was ten thousand. I was like, once it hits ten thousand, we're on the moon. And we did that a long time ago. I've been on the moon for a long time now. Um, <laughs> Lambos are another term for a Lamborghini. We like to say in this space, when the when when we hit the moon, then we'll buy Lambos. I, I don't want a Lambo, but a lot of people do because they're cool cars. FUD is uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. This is usually news articles written by people who don't who don't understand Bitcoin's real drawbacks, but they they read an article about that Bitcoin mining uses a lot of electricity or something, and then they'll be like, "Oh yeah, Bitcoin's going to boil the oceans." And it's like we have no idea what this. Like, <laughs> if they were if they were if they were plugging into the coal fired power plants, they, they would that very costly electricity and they would not be profitable. You know, they're, they're using renewable sources. That's the only way to be profitable in this space. Uh, or they're using stranded electricity that's going to be dumped, dumped or flared into the atmosphere. Um, but the people who don't, don't know what the real drawbacks are, they make up their own and then they, they spread fear, uncertainty and doubt about it. And that's, that's what those articles we call it. Yeah, this, is, this is just a FUD article. It's, they don't really know what they're talking about. And then there's um, wrecked is the last term we're going to put on here. It's when your portfolio goes down. The line. What happened to this guy, the hodler? Yeah, he's, he, he lost a lot of money. And if you lose a lot of money, your portfolio is down 95%. We say you got wrecked. And we, we spell that wrong too. It's usually caused by leverage. And, uh, like trading with, you take out a huge loan and you mortgage your house for a whole lot of money. And then the price shoots down and you're like, God, now I'm screwed. Lost my house and my girl and my dog. And then it's also caused by trading all the coins. There's a lot of scams in this space and a lot of coins that don't make any sense. And they're like, oh, we're going to start some sort of network and then you can only use our network if you buy our token first. And it's like, I'll just not use your network. How's that? But they think you're, people buy these things and then they, and they get wrecked up. Any questions? This, this is the end. We're done with the presentation now. So you can stop recording and we'll take questions. I will stop recording. Thank you very much for everybody listening. I will have this up online uh, late tonight or really early in the morning. And I will share the link in the uh, uh, meetup and Telegram and Twitter. And I believe that's it. I'll also do an email uh, if I can remember that too. Stop